by The Oldest Enemy by Michael J. Webb, now available at Amazon.com. An ancient evil will be released upon the world, an epic battle between light and darkness. Only one man can stop it. David Lighthouse was once a hard-hitting investigative reporter for the Denver Post. Back before he was accused of the brutal murder of his fiancée, his life unraveled. But now, he suddenly finds himself the target of sinister supernatural forces as he tracks down a conspiracy to release an ancient evil upon an unsuspecting world. By The Oldest Enemy by Michael J. Webb. Now available at Amazon.com. Is there a war coming in the Middle East? Are we headed toward a one world government, a one world religious system? Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of the time we are living in? Are we in the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the world as we know it? And what are the increase of UFO sightings? While we may disagree as to what is causing the phenomena, we can agree that it is real, burgeoning, and not going away. Is this the coming great deception that ancient prophecy warns us about? Does time seem to be accelerating? Join me, your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, as we explore these and other riveting and stimulating topics. This is Acceleration Radio. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. Welcome to yet another episode of Acceleration Radio. I'd like to thank Richard Grun for filling in for me um, a couple of weeks back. It was great. Um, thank you, Rich. I was on the road, couldn't do it. And, uh, of course, last week we had the Nephilim Mounds Conference. And I know hats off to our good our friend and producer, uh, Rick, for doing a sort of a compilation of two or three interviews which uh, were very apropos considering that we were in Newark, Ohio, doing the Nephilim Mounds Conference, which was, I really had a blast. Met some great people. Um, I spoke for like three hours on Saturday, and Richard and Richard Grun and Russ Disdrar also spoke for three hours. Uh, Russ kicked it off on Friday night, followed by Richard. I was last a little sleepy on, on Friday night, folks. Got to tell you, a little sleepy. Uh, Fritz Zimmerman and I uh, hiked all over the place on on Friday. We were everywhere. Uh, went to some very interesting mounds and locations, and some of that uh, will be in the forthcoming book, a Nephilim on the Trail of a Nephilim, which will be released in 2013. But uh, Fritz did a wonderful job on Sunday, taking the people to the Great Circle Mound, and of course, we went also to the Octagon. If you've never been there, the Great Circle Mound is 1,250 feet in diameter, which coincidentally, <laughs> in quotes, is the same diameter as the circle in Avebury, Avebury, England. Now, that begs the question, is this just a coincidence? Or is this done by the same race of people? Fritz and I, and also Russ and Richard, all four of us agree that this is all Nephilim architecture. And more than likely, the scenario is when Joshua and Caleb came into the promised land to clear the land from the giants that were there. And we have Josephus telling us, Josephus is a first century Jewish historian whose works are, can be still be read today. It's actually survived antiquity. It's about 2,000 years old. Unbelievable. And Josephus himself tells us that the Nephilim were in the Levant, in the promised land, and that they had countenance so large and... Um, and they were so fierce that, that humans would, would tremble at the sight of them. Goliath, in my opinion, was a Nephilim, as were her, as his four brothers. All that to say this, that when Joshua and Caleb began to <clears throat> press into the Levant, or what's known as the Promised Land, Promised Land of Canaan, some of the Nephilim fled. They saw what was happening. They saw that they were being massacred. They fled up through Europe. They fled into England. They probably built Avebury, I can't prove that, some of the other mounds, and they came over here, settled in the Ohio Valley, and actually spread out through the Americas, literally spread out through the Americas. Are you aware, ladies and gentlemen, that we have 
giant skeletons found here in California, right off from where I live, Santa Rosa Island, Catalina Island. I will be going out to Catalina on October 14th and meeting with a gentleman there. And I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be an interesting meeting. And we will be discussing the Nephilim bones that apparently were found on Catalina in the 1920s. So there you have it. That was a little bit of a Nephilim Mounds conference. Um, what really blew me away, and if you have not been to the blog, go to lamarzuli.wordpress.com. You have to scroll down a little bit. And I actually was on Coast to Coast with George Norrie this week on Tuesday. And we were discussing the very large, in fact, it's the second largest crop circle ever created in North America. This puppy was about 400 by 700 feet, absolutely humongous, in a field of corn. Now, here's the deal. When you look at a cornfield and you realize that the corn plants are seven to eight feet tall, all right, we're not in Kansas anymore. Because you don't got a guy, a couple of guys in there with walkie-talkies and strings and boards. It's not happening. What you've got is a standing field, a standing, a standing um, crop in a field of corn. And that corn is between six and eight feet tall, which means that a human being can't even discern where they are in that field. There's no way to communicate or draw anything because you can't use a string. You'd have to have a helicopter, GPS, walkie-talkies, and probably about two or three weeks to create something like this. The gentleman I spoke to, Jeffrey Wilson, who is a lead investigator of this circle, and I'm trying to get him on the show next week, folks, to talk more about this circle in Chillicothe, uh, Ohio, said that it was one of the most complex circles he has ever been in. 700 by 400 feet. The crop was laid down in an unbelievably complex way. Some of the stalks were bent at four inches. Others were bent four feet uh, above the ground. So from four inches from the top to, you know, going down about, about three feet, four feet. Unbelievable circle. I'm anxious to see his close-up pictures. And when we get that, hopefully Jeffrey will come on the show next week and we can have a full-length discussion about this. Um, let, me, let me ask you guys something. And by the way, folks, we will be taking calls tonight. That number will be, but after the break, it will be 888-682-7688, um, 888-682-7688, 888-682-7688. We began this Nephilim conference, Nephilim Mounts conference. It is the only one like it that I'm, ever, I'm aware of. No one, as far as I know, has ever dealt with the mounds that are in Newark, Ohio, from a biblical perspective, specifically relating to the Nephilim. And Russ Dizdar and Richard Grun and myself addressed this um, from Friday to Sunday, along with Fritz Zimmerman giving us a tour of the mounds. And also, Fritz believes, as I do, that these are Nephilim architecture. Is it possible? We know that the fallen one, also known as the prince of the power of the air. Think about that. The prince of the power of the air. And we know that when you stand inside the Great Circle Mount or go to the Octagon Mound in Ohio, one can only really appreciate what has been done on the ground when one sits in a helicopter above the hinge. The hinge is, a, is what this Great Circle is. It is a... Um, an area, like a walled an area, that's a mound, surrounded by a uh, circle in the inside. And that's, that's what a henge is, and that's what the Great Circle Mound is. But in order to really see the complex, one must be in a helicopter or an airplane to see the complexity of the Great Circle Mound, which connects to the Octagon Mound. What is interesting is all these old trees have grown up on the Circle Mound and in the Octagon Mound, which is now a golf course. So it's very difficult to actually see the complexity of the earthworks of the mounds and what these what these people or or what the whoever did it uh, created. Because in my opinion, um, I don't think human beings had too much to do with this. This is Nephilim architecture, in my opinion. Uh, one of my highlights, which um, kind of blew me away um, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the presentation, Russ's presentation, Richard's presentation, um, Richard was talking about the frequency of sound. And uh, it was just an amazing presentation. Um, and Russ, of course, was talking about uh, the Lebensborn 
breeding program, World War II, Dr. Mengele, the Nephilim uh, babies trying to backbreed into this whole Nephilim um, bloodline. Just amazing stuff. These tapes will be available. These DVDs will be available. Sam Miller, our friend, was up there and he filmed everything. So they'll be available probably sometime in November, and they'll be available on the website, lamarzuli.net. So you can uh, procure that and um, uh, uh, avail yourself of this uh, vital information without going to the conference. So there, about 12, I think we're going to have about 12 hours or maybe more. I I'm actually about 15 hours, perhaps. It it's a lot of yak, so um, yeah, it's more like 15 hours. So you might want to check that out, and um, we more information on the blog, lamarzuli.net. Dot WordPress dot com. The Nephilim Mounts Conference was just fantastic. Um, I also like to make a shout out to Deborah Collins and Buck Collins. Uh, they sort of hosted me on Wednesday. I got there on Tuesday, a week ago from this Tuesday this week. So I was there for seven days. And um, Deborah and Buck drove me down to the Serpent Mount on Wednesday, along with a wonderful woman who, met, who I met for the second time. Her name is Dolly. And uh, I'll, I'm going to tell you this story because you'll find it interesting. In 1987, there was something called the Harmonic Convergence in the Serp on the Serpent Mound, 1987, um, and that's down in Peebles, Ohio. There's a, a the ancient earthworks and and a road stretched at one time from Newark, Ohio, to Chillicothe. Well, below Chillicothe is where the Great Serpent Mound is, and Dolly, who's a born again Christian, and I would say is sort of an, an elderess. And um, in some ways, uh, uh, the keeper of the, perhaps the entire region. The Lord told her, woke, awakened her in the wee hours of the morning, told her to get dressed and go down to the Serpent Mound. And so she was obedient. And so she goes down to the Serpent Mound and, and, and the mouth of the serpent. And if you go to the, to the blog site, you'll see some of the pictures. You've got to scroll down for it, but it's there. Of, of the Serpent Mound. And you'll see where the mouth is open. And in that opening... Um, that effigy of the great serpent, that the entire area was filled with crystals, filled with crystals. And there were um, scores of New Agers who descended on the serpent mount. And, and Dolly said, what am I doing here, Lord? And the Lord said, move to the head of the snake. So she did. And as she was doing that, someone, one of the speakers, called everybody back to the tail of the snake. So the entire group went back to the snail, the tail of the snake, and Dolly stood on the head of the serpent. Isn't that interesting? I will crush your head. Isn't that just interesting, the symbology there? And Dolly asked the Lord, what, sh what should I do now? And the Lord told her what to pray. And so Dolly prayed that, and she closed the gate. The Lord told her, I want you to close the gate. She had, she had never closed the gate or portal, anything like that. God had no idea what it was, but she did it. She was obedient. And she also had a word for us on Sunday while we were there. And as which, she was doing uh, she that, delivered, someone, one of those uh, on Sunday afternoon, and she basically closed the conference with it. So that's some of the highlights of a Nephilim Mounds conference. It was just great to, to see some old faces, meet some new people. Uh, a shout out for Pastor Tom, who was there and uh, allowed us to use the facility of a Lutheran church, a wonderful man, um, a man that's sort of alone there. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of people helping him deal with some of the demonic, the ongoing demonic activity that seems to be manifesting in and around the Newark, Ohio area and because of the mountains. We believe, Russ and Richard and myself, that this crop circle was no coincidence. That it was almost like a welcome. And what I mean by that, I mean that facetiously, of course. That um, the fallen one, the prince of the power of the air, made his presence known in a way that really um, got some legs and some national attention because I went on George Norrie's show and talked about it. Jeffrey Williams blogged about it on Crop Circle Connector. Uh, so it became an international um, phenomena. Now, what's interesting is, is Jeffrey Wilson wasn't aware of our conference in Newark. And when I speak to him next week, when I return from Albuquerque, I will be uh, talking to him about that, which is a good time to take a little uh, diversion from the Nephilim Mounds Conference and talk about 
I will be in Albuquerque along with my friend Doug Camp uh, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday. I'm getting up at 3.30 to hop on a plane at 6 o'clock and get to Albuquerque. I'll be speaking Friday night along with Doug. We're sharing the platform uh, on Saturday and, of course, Sunday. I'm home on Monday again. So another busy week. We've had like two days. I'm just getting over jet lag, and I'm about to get jet lagged again tomorrow. So uh, we'll be okay. We get we'll catch up in the hotel and get some sleep and and uh, looking forward to meeting and greeting people in Albuquerque and, of course, um, warning them of the coming great deception of what, where we are in the Middle East, what is happening in the Middle East. And uh, that is a great segue to go into. Um, today, in the last 48 hours, the Turkish uh, military has been striking Syria with a barrage of artillery fire. And, of course, this is not a good thing because it escalates an already fragile uh, and destabilized area. Uh, certainly the Turks shelling Syria can only bring about a response from Syria. And as we know, the Iranians now have at least minimum 2,000 troops, possibly a lot more, in Syria. So it's a question of the whole area. Every morning I wake up, i got to tell you folks, I'll be honest with you here, I grow weary of looking. I mean, it's like in when already. We know, we know that there, for whatever reason, it hasn't happened yet. But at some point, it's going to, and it gets weary because we watch and we watch and we watch, and there's there's saber rattling going on all the time, and yet nothing ever takes place. And 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 listen. My heart says this. I don't want to see anything happen there. I wish everybody would just live peacefully, but that doesn't seem to be the case because you've got uh, Turkey shelling Syria. Another point of interest is Jordan. The Muslim Brotherhood now has targeted the King of Jordan, King Abdullah II, and he is scrambling. He's already disbanded his parliament. Uh, he's fired um, another um, um, official. I think it was one of the uh, prime ministers of, of Jordan, and he is being called uh, to step down by the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, if the Muslim Brotherhood takes Jordan, Israel will find herself in a pincer move. Egypt on her, on her south flank, southwestern flank, and Jordan directly to her east. What's interesting is about, about this is I have blogged and talked about the King of Jordan as being a major player in the area because the King of Jordan holds the keys to the Temple Mount. Never forget that. He holds the keys. He controls the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. He's also a Hashemite king. Hashem is the uncle of Muhammad. He holds great sway in both the Sunni and Shia Muslim world. So it's interesting to see what will happen to Abdullah. Will he go the way of Mubarak? Or will he be more of like an Assad after 18 months, Assad is still on his feet and still fighting for his political uh, prowess to remain intact. I find that just incredibly interesting. We'll see what happens with King Abdullah. In the meantime, uh, it certainly looks unstable as the Muslim Brotherhood are threatening 50,000 people a day, uh, demonstrating for the king to step down. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens here. And remember, right now, there still is a multinational task force that is on the border of Jordan and Syria, poised that if Assad falls, they will swoop in and create some sort of an interim stable government and make sure that the chemical weapons do not Repeat, do not fall into the hands of terrorists. Bashar al-Assad has a very the largest cache of chemical weapons in the Middle East. And of course, can you imagine if he, if he loses control of his country, what happens to those chemical weapons? Whose hands will they fall into? Can we imagine if they fall into al-Qaeda or the Muslim Brotherhood? Anything is possible. With the hatred and the vitriol for the state of Israel, uh, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that the first thing that they will do will be to go and attack Israel with chemical weapons, which would just be um, insane, in my opinion. Of course, let's hope cool heads will prevail. And the scenario I outlined, remember, it's just a scenario. But if you got a chemical weapons, you're going to use it. That's what it's for. And uh, hopefully they will not use it. In other news, um, Iran lost 50% of its currency, the rial. Uh, had 50% of its currency was lost overnight. And, of course, this sends 
it's like waking up like this, folks. Let's say you've got $50,000 in your savings account. Well, I don't know who has $50,000 in their savings account. I know I don't. But let's say, hypothetically, you've got fifty grand, and that's your retirement. You're going, you know, I'm not, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm doing okay. And you wake up the next morning, and you find out that uh, you went to bed with $50,000. That same $50,000 has been devalued. Now it's only worth 25000 the world is crushing Iran and doing so economically. And what we see with this later, this latest devaluation of Iran's currency, the real, um, what is happening is, is it sends a message uh, to the people there that they've just lost 50% of their wealth overnight. Now these people that are in the country are taking a hard, hard look at the regime of the mullahs scratching your heads and going this isn't working the world hates us i just lost half of my life savings is there anybody else we can bring in and maybe that's what we're looking at is an orchestrated attempt to, for a regime change uh, in iran the problem i have with all of this you won't find the muslim brotherhood in iran because the muslim brotherhood is pretty much sunni muslim and and iran is ardently Shia Muslim. So you've got this uh, discrepancy between the, the sex, which goes me, sex me way, sex way me, sex into Iraq, which uh, the sectarian violence continues. Read here. We always hear that in, in, in the weasel industry media. They're always going, well, today the sectarian violence continue in Iraq. Why don't you just tell us what sectarian violence means? It means that the Sunni Muslims and the Shia Muslims are blowing each other up. They're killing each other. That's what it means. Don't call it sectarian violence. That's doublespeak. Be honest. The Sunnis hate the Shia. The Shia hate the Sunnis. And they're blowing each other up. That's what's going on here. It's ridiculous. Call it for what it is. How many people saw the, uh, the uh, debates last night? I got to tell you, man, you know, I realize that Romney and Obama allegedly have gone to Bohemian Grove, so they're both insiders. I get that. And I understand that there's a shadow government that probably controls most of what we're looking at. I get that. I get that. But I hold on to the hope that somehow the, the so-called secret group of men and women in Washington known as the White Hats know what's going on and are attempting to steer the dialogue and steer the course of a nation to a different path. Um, Romney, in my opinion, massacred Obama last night. Obama seemed uh, lifeless, uh, listless, unsure of himself, um, bored, um, petulant. Shall I continue? I think you guys get the point. And Romney was Reagan-esque, in my opinion. He was Reagan-esque. In fact, at one point, I, was, I looked at my wife and said, he sounds like, he sounds like Reagan. He did. He was in command of the facts, command of the information, rattled them off. Uh, but he was speaking from core values. There was the difference, in my opinion. If you've got to boil a debate down, it's this. Romney, although you know people go, well, he flip-flops. He flip-flops. Well, I flip-flop, okay? I do. We all flip-flop. You know, we were entitled to change our opinion on certain things as time goes on. I'll give you an example. 35 years ago, I was pro-abortion. Oh, L.A. Marzulli flip-flopped. Yeah, now I'm absolutely pro-life and ardently so. Life begins at conception. So is that is that a flip-flop? Or did I embrace a new paradigm? Hmm? Fifteen years ago, I was pro-death penalty. Now I'm not so sure. Okay, I'm debating that one. Does that mean I'm flip-flopping? Or am I weighing new evidence? Am I, am I, have I had a revelation an insight that's changed my thinking. See how that works? But the media double spins and, and, and spins and spins and spins. And so, oh, oh, Romney is a flip-flopper. You have to be careful. He's a flip-flopper. It's ridiculous. See, they, they call him a name and they'll, they'll hoist up all these things where he says one thing and then says something else. I get it, but we all do it. I just demonstrated why. The bottom line is Ob Obama had nothing. And the difference between the candidates, in my opinion, is Romney has real core values. And so he, does, he goes to those core values, and from those core values come his arguments. Obama has no core values that he can really stand on. And that's why he was like a deer in the headlights to the entire debate. 
And I'm not the only one who's saying this. I mean, every, pretty much every news media, including New York Times, which is about as left wing as you can get, you know, oh, Xanax, that was one of, the, one of the titles of the article. Is Obama on Xanax? You know, what, what's going on here? Anyway, folks, I don't know whether if Romney gets elected, whether the course of our nation will change. Interestingly enough, when I was in Newark, Ohio, we'll take a break here in five minutes, then to go back to your questions and uh, take some callers at, at the top of the hour after our break. We'll, um, you know, take your calls and questions. I got a bunch of them in my email, and I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. We'll see how far it goes. I didn't realize I've been blabbing here for half an hour already and probably continue the rest of the show, but I'll, I'll end it by saying this. In Newark, Ohio, there was a, a team of high school students, two high school students out on the street. My wife and I were going to um, um, this one little, I can't remember the name of the town. It's, it's, I think it's east of or west of Newark, um, Gavilon, or I, I, just, I just can't remember. But it's a quaint little town. It's just beautiful. It reminded me of it, it, It's a Wonderful Life. Just a wonderful Disneyland-type town. Very clean and little shops and great restaurants. We went to this Italian uh, restaurant called Bella. Just amazing. If you're ever in that area, look that up, Bella. Incredible restaurant. Great Italian food. The owner of the store, or the restaurant rather, loves what she does. And the service... It was amazing. Sounds like a commercial. Anyway, um, before we got there, there were these two high school students, a boy and a girl, and uh, they had a camera set up, and they said, sir, would you mind answering a couple of questions on camera? And I looked at the young man, and I said, I said young man, today is your lucky day. Uh, this is what I do for a living. I stood in front of the camera, and he asked me about the Fourth Amendment rights, and now I was off to the races. He asked me about the illegal search and seizures, uh, search and seizures uh, indefinite detention, and we were off to the races just like that. And the moment I started uh, with my uh, monologue, because that's what it was, uh, he looked at his, his partner and just grinned ear for mirror. He knew he had paid dirt. So that was sort of a fun little um, diversion for my wife and I, and then we went in and had a wonderful dinner, and um, the next morning we were on a plane back to Los Angeles. Um, that morning... We were that day actually the day that uh, which was Monday. We were supposed to run a plane and go up and look at the crop circle over in Chillicothe, but we were told by the lead investigator that the farmer had already harvested the first 20 rows of corn and it would, wouldn't be worth doing. So we passed on it. Interestingly enough, on the way to the airport, which was in Columbus, Ohio, from Newark, we were taking the Route 16 all the way to Columbus. About halfway there, on the right hand side. Um, I was driving, my wife is looking, there's another field of corn, very large field of corn. And she looks at me and she goes, I think there's a crop circle out there. And I caught it in the corner of my eye and I went, wow, what is that? So I called a friend, Deborah Collins and her, and her husband, Buck, and also their, their colleague, Chelsea, who became my eyes and ears on the ground. They went out there today. Sure enough, there is something there. And Deborah is going to try to investigate it via an airplane. We'll be giving, getting back to you more on that in the next couple of days as information trickles in from that sighting. Well, folks, we're going to take a break here. I've, I've kind of shot my wad pretty much of a half an hour of rant news and uh, information for you. Hope that's been informative to you. And uh, this week, and again, I'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, www.calvarychapeleast, calvarychapeleast.com, calvarychapeleast.com. I'll be speaking with Doug Hamp. Want to get on the show tonight? The number, 888-682-7688. That number again, 888-682-7688. Keep it right here, folks. We'll see you on the other side of the break. This is Acceleration Radio. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. We're on the Fringe Radio Network, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Are you concerned about your financial future? Banks are failing, stock prices declining, and the government just keeps printing money. Eventually, our dollar will have little more value than monopoly money. Limit your exposure to the declining value of the U.S. dollar. Purchase gold and silver coins and bullion, which, by the way, has never gone to zero in value and is resurging. Eagle European Capital is your trusted source for gold and silver coins and bullion. A company based on Christian principles, Eagle European Capital strives to provide expert advice on which metals to meet your financial needs. 
They also offer free resources to help you become a prudent person who foresees danger and takes precautions. Visit our website at www.eagleeuropeancapital.com or call for your free consultation, one 623 1239 You don't have to fear the future. Face it prepared. Call one 623 1239 today. Visit www.comein.ws today. Train at home for a new career in healthcare. Take advantage of affordable tuition, short completion timelines, and graduate assistance. Over 65,000 students have chosen us for these benefits and many more. Our school's commitment to quality ensures that graduates have the skills they need to succeed in their new career. Our courses include medical transcription and editing, medical coding and billing, pharmacy technician with Walgreens and CVS externships available, computer technician, medical administrative assisting, medical billing, administrative assisting, and more. Our programs are all approved for MyCAA funding, which can completely cover the costs for eligible military spouses. Students in the Canadian provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec can also enroll in select programs. Learn more. Visit www.comein.ws today. That's www.comein.ws. Visit today. You're listening to the Fringe Radio Network right here at FringeRadioNetwork.com. If you would like to sponsor a program or advertise on our website, please contact us. Join the Fringe Radio Network on Facebook and subscribe to our programs on iTunes and tell your friends about us. We're so glad you've joined the Fringe. And now, back to the show. It's Ellie Marzilli. You're listening to Acceleration Radio. I'm your intrepid host. Uh, let's get right into some questions. And again, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, give us a shout, you can do that. I'll, I'll give you that number again in a little bit. Let me do this real quick here. Hold on. Uh, and I will start reading the... Um, yeah, here we go. I'll start reading some questions. Why aren't you working? It's not working. Give me a second, guys. Hold on. Let me get rid of that. Let me do this. If you want to get on the show, there we go. It's uh, 888-682-7688. That number again in Omani, 888-682-7688. Here's a question from Gina. Uh, she's sort of a fan of the show and seen her at a bunch of different conferences, loves Russ's work and Richard's work, and she writes, Hi, LA, great conference. Thank you, Gina. Can you tell me if crop circles in the Ohio Valley Mounds area have happened before? Yes, they have. Uh, according to Jeffrey Wilson, who's a crop circle investigator, they have happened. She writes, I don't think it was a coincidence that the crop circle occurred right before the conference. Gina, I couldn't um, concur with you more. Um, I don't think it was coincidence at all. I think it's a sign from the fallen one. I'd be interesting to see if anyone has an interpretation for the circles and what they may have meant or what, what message may actually be contained in them. Uh, Gina then writes, Pastor Tom Olson really needs our prayers and support. And I certainly agree with you th with you there. Uh, he's sort of alone in that valley, but the good news is Russ is like less than two hours away by car, and I'm only a phone call away. Same thing with Richard. So uh, we need to lift this guy up. He's um, in a very dangerous area. Let's leave it at that. Um, she writes, please let us know how to order the DVDs from the conference. Once again, Gina, um, that will be available um, on my website, on Russ's website, Richard's website, and the blogs, just keep a lookout. Probably sometime in November, those DVDs will be available. And I got to tell you, there's about at least 15 to 16 hours um, that are uh, that are recorded on those DVDs, and I think there's a lot of great information there up to the minute. If you know nothing about the Nephilim or the mounds uh, or you want to get some sort of a backstory, this is certainly a good place uh, to check it out. Let me continue. And on these, here we go. Um, this is from James. Hey, Mr. Marzulli, great show the other night on Coast Radio. Thank you. The Giants are mentioned 
all over the occult literature in the 1800s to 1900s. Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, a channeler and writer of Theosophy Occult Movement, described the four ages of man. Yes, I am completely aware of this. Uh, very interesting. Um, this isn't really uh, a question. It's more of a statement, but he's got some great, great clippings. Let me, let me read you some of this stuff, folks. The bones are described in the French science paper, and I won't even bother to read that in French because I can't. They were identified as human without question, twice as thick and twice as long as normal. Leading the anthropologist uh, Jorge Vacher de la Poge to conclude the man was about three and a half meters tall, over 11 feet tall. For instance, the circumference of the fragment of the femoral midshaft was 16 centimeters. In a normal man, the thickness of a thigh bone is but eight to nine centimeters in circumference. And there's pictures of this. It's just amazing. Um, the bones of uh, different si normal sizes in the center and then these giant bones. This is a great article. A race of giant and old Gaul. In the year 1890, some human boards, bones of enormous size, double the ordinary in fact, were found in the tumulus of Castlenau and have uh, been, since been carefully examined by Professor Keener who, while admitting that the bones are those of a very tall race, nevertheless finds them abnormal in dimensions and apparently of morbid growth. They undoubtedly reopen the question of the giants of antiquity, but do not furnish sufficient evidence to decide it. Hmm. Wow, this is from 1892 of the New York Times. Giants of prehistoric France. Wow. In a prehistoric cemetery recently uncovered in Montpellier, France, the workmen were excavating a waterworks reservoir. Human skulls were found measuring 28, 31, 32 inches in circumference. The bones which were found with the skulls were also of gigantic proportions. These relics were sent to the Paris Academy and a learned savant who lectured on the find says they belong to a race of men between 10 and 15 feet in height. Bones of giants unearthed near Paris. Uh, military prisoners digging at Vandencourt near Paris discovered a tomb thousands of years old of unpolished slabs of stone with human bones of gigantic proportion. The skulls were oval and the teeth resembled those of a horse. Our anthropologists and archaeologists said the tomb dates back to the Copper Age. This goes on, folks. It's just a great great source of information. I have to write James back and certainly thank him for sending that. A lot of information for my book on the trail of the Nephilim, and I will certainly uh, be using that um, oops, in the up-and-coming book available next year. Um, here's from Jose. Hello, LA. Question. The flood of Noah. Where did all the extra water come from to flood the earth? If the water was on the earth, how could it flood the earth? Well, Joe, it's interesting. We're told that the fountains of the deep opened up. In other words, reservoirs which were inside the earth opened up, and it just began to flood. We also know that there could have been something um, inc like, like a pole shift, which would have thrown the existing oceans and made a complete disaster. We also know that it rained 40 days and 40 nights. So we had never seen rain before un until that part. But two things are happening. The rain is coming from the heavens, which had never happened before. There could have been a mantle over the entire earth, all right, a mantle, like, like, like a dome above the earth. So some people theorize that. And that dome could have been a layer. When that, when that dome was broken, that's when this, the deluge from above and the deluge from below, and that flooded the earth. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the uh, question. And we will be going to Mary Jo. Mary Jo, thanks for listening to Celebration Radio. I've heard about fallen angels since I was a child, learning from my catechism lessons that Satan was a fallen angel. Are they non-physical? I assume they probably are. They must be. Well, they're non-physical, but all throughout Scripture, um, Mary Jo, we see that they are mistaken for men. Uh, one of the earliest examples of that is with Abraham. Abraham sees three men that approach him. He slays the fatted calf. They all sit down and eat. And then the two angels proceed to Sodom. Why, the third, which some of us believe is the pre-incarnate Christ, or Yeshua, remains with Abraham, and they have a little conversation, which is uh, very noteworthy. But the, the angels can appear for men. We also know from the New Testament, Paul's writing tells us that angels 
or that some people have entertained because of the gift of hospitality, and in doing so, opening your houses to strangers have entertained angels unawares. She then writes, how do fallen angels get somewhere and how do we recognize them? Well, good question. We don't know all the protocols of the heavenly realm, but we do know that they're able to materialize and dematerialize. For instance, when Peter is in the jail cell, right? We all know this. One of my favorite stories. The angel appears next to him and uh, communicates, get up, Peter. Peter's like sleeping. He's not sure he's awake or asleep, actually. Let me, let me rephrase that. Peter is so startled, he's not as sure whether he's awake or asleep. Uh, he looks around and his fellow cellmates fall asleep. Chains suddenly fall off of Peter. The, door cell, the jail door opens by itself. Peter goes out into the hallway. The Roman guards are asleep. How is that possible? Okay. The main prison gate opens by itself. The angel is manipulating matter and, 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 and the physicality which surrounds us in ways that, that we don't know how he does that. And then when the angel leaves, he just appears. He just goes back into this other dimension, which seems to be able to interface with us from time to time. We don't see God, she writes. We're told he is a spirit. Then learn God is neither male or female, but he is a, he is a source of energy. Well, we, differ, we differentiate on that. We uh, differ in that opinion. Um, and that's what he is, made in the image and likeness. We are made in the image and likeness of, of him. The first was Adam, and made from the dust of the earth, made in, in his image and likeness. Um, I don't believe God is female. I also heard, she writes, that the angels were God's creation. All this stuff is non-physical, but we talk about it as a given and taken uncle, but we can't see them. So how do we know they look like? Well, we've had people who have actually encountered these angelic beings, uh, Mary Jo, and we've got biblical accounts. If you crack open the Bible, you'll see there are scores of accounts of angelic messengers and angelic beings uh, appearing to men and women. Certainly when Mary, the mother of Yeshua, had her angelic encounter, uh, the angel said, do not be afraid. You are chosen. You are blessed, highly favored amongst all women. How is that possible? The angel has physicality, okay? And he appears to Mary, and Mary, of course, is terrified. And the angel comes with this message of hope, announcing basically the Messiah's birth. Um, anyway, she continues. I'm gonna, she's got a gazillion questions here. I hope I answered some of them. The, the bottom line, let me, let me get to some of this um, stuff. Let me see here. As we humans of planet Earth merge into the forest and entities and beyond, we will know the chemical bodies we have now. Right? So as we evolve, we'll, we'll be like non-physical entities the angels are. If there are angels, why are there fallen angels? What purpose do they serve? Well, the fallen angels fell of their own volition. Satan led alien for the, the, the roots of that rebellion, the nexus of that rebellion. We're not sure. We only that a third of the host of heaven fallen. As far as the fourth and fifth densities, I don't believe in any of that. Uh, I believe that we have an eternal soul. And when we die, that soul is, is sent someplace. It is actually in front of its maker at that moment. We know from Scripture, to be dead is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Who is the Lord? Yeshua Lord. So to be absent from the body is to be present with who? Yeshua. So there's no evolving. Now, if, if you mean evolving in a sense that I'm leaving, shedding this tent, as the apostle would say, and, and leaving this body and going... If that's evolving in your vernacular or in your paradigm, then I would agree with you. But we're not evolved in any sort of Darwinians, sort of Darwinian supernaturalists, if there is such a thing. Darwin was an ardent supernaturalist, so that's not going to fly. Let me last question here for, for Mary Jo. If someone dies of a lot of negativity in their aura or energy body, see, this is all New Age stuff, Mary Jo, and of course I don't hold to this paradigm. I used to, but not anymore. We're now told they don't go to a bad place like hell was previously by religion. They go to a extreme relaxation area where they are helped and aided by the spies and forever long to be rehabilitated and they'll go from there. Now, it's an interesting dogma. Um, I just don't believe that particular dogma. We, we hear and we see over and over and over again that this lake of fire, which is hell, is a real place. And the Antichrist and the beast and the false prophet will be thrown alive into the lake of fire. We also know that anyone who takes the mark will be thrown into the lake of fire. So, you know, some of this stuff in the flower conversation, Mary Jo, and we've got like 15 minutes left, so I don't have time to, you know, go through everything. But I think I've answered your question, hopefully. And, um, you know, hopefully if you are interested in the conversation, you can write me. One-liners work really well for me. One question at a time, folks. If you want to get my attention, the, the shorter it is, 
uh, and the more pithy it is, uh, you're more likely to get a response. Right now, I've got, ooh, amazing. I've got 1,800 unopened emails on my account. And here's the reason why a lot of stuff doesn't get answered. Um, people say war and peace. People uh, will write um, rambling emails uh, or ask 15 questions. And at that point, with all due respect, I say this is why I write books and produce DVDs to answer these questions so I don't have to type them out on an individual basis. When I do, in fact, respond to a person on an email, and I'm saying this, folks, I'm just telling you what, what it's like. I now have a new a, a, pen, a pen pal, a new a new friend, and so if I answer th that person, he or she then replies to that answer, which then I have to reply to that answer and see what happens. So the the number never goes down. No matter I could sit here all day answering emails, the number never goes down. It actually increases. It's my dilemma, and I'm faced with it. I do try to answer them. I do. Um, I, I'm diligent in the morning. It's the first word. First thing I do is get up and I read as many emails as I possibly can. Try to answer them all. But I'm, you know, I, again, I'm just so far behind. I get hundreds of emails a day and I just can't possibly keep up with them all. This is from John. I heard of you on Coast to Coast concerning the mounds. The show is coming upon a mounding with his father. Did he email you about the location? No, he has. And I'm really interested in finding that out. Also, do you know if any of the land these mounds exist on are privately owned? Yes, some of them are. If so, I'd say raise funds to purchase some land where there are mounds, and that's the heck out of it. You would own the skeletal remains and finally put an end to the skeptics. Well, Matt, the problem with that is any type of mound work, uh, the Ohio Archaeological Society, um, you got to get a permit to go dig and all this other stuff. What we're trying to do, we've got some leads. I'm not at liberty to talk about them. We've got some leads in private collections. We also have some leads in South America that we're very interested in and looking at that are actually, in fact, already on YouTube. So it's not like discovering anything. We just want to go down probably in February and take a look at that. Matt, thank you much. Um, hope that was for Matt. Else. Email. Matt, thank you. Really appreciate it. And, um, I hope that answers your question. Here's a question from Jason. Jason, so much for Elevation Radio. Hi, LA. My name is York, Crystal, Tennessee. I am a Christian, and I keep up with all the radio shows like Coast Coast Give. Inside me is up. Something I have heard on any of these shows lately is a lot of talk about people channeling the Council of El. I just want to take on this. I do feel we are heading to the return of the Savior Jesus. I agree. I am called to watch. Thanks for me. Keep up good work. Um, Council of Elohim, these are the extended masters um, we've heard about from new age groups for a while. And, of course, in my opinion, they're not uh, the Elohim. This is not who they say they are. This is part of a deception. This deception is rooted in uh, age of cult beliefs. Uh, the ascended masters, channeling is forbidden. Guy book of e. the Bible. Channeling is opening oneself up to a familiar spirit, which we are told not to do, and allowing the spirit to either partially or fully possess the person. Uh, we are warned not to do this because these entities will not let go. Once you give them right and legal right permission to come in, they do not want to leave because it's the only way they can manifest in the physical third dimension that we have here is to inhabit a human body. Thanks so much for the call, Jason, or the email, I should say, and um, I appreciate that. Folks, we're getting down to about the 10-minute mark here. This is L.A. You're listening to Acceleration Radio. I'm um, going um, um, to come up and uh, Jeffrey Wilson to come on the show and talk about the uh, large crop formation in and around uh, Chillicothe, which we were talking about tonight. Let me see. I know there's some more here. And let me just go up. Uh, let me see if I can find one. Hello. Okay, let's try this one. Whoops, that looking video show. Sorry, folks. <laughs> but the but the thing said the the, um, the the headline said anyway. Let's let's continue. Here's one. This is Chris Embre. Heard your segment on Nephilim mounds on coast to coast. And the end times are going to be like the day of Noah. Do you think we will see the return of the giants, or is the advent of so-called grays the equivalent of the Nephilim in modern times? Interesting. You write it is going to be of Noah. And what differentiates the days of Noah from any other time is the presence of Elohim. So the, the question is, the advent, the revealing, the manifestation of a so-called grace equivalent in modern times. Well, that's a good question. In my opinion, and get this, in my opinion, the grays are generated by body suits. What I mean by that is the full one 
has created these suits, allowed them to manifest. Demons are disembodied spirits. It's all fear, folks. All fear, okay? Demons, in my opinion, are disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Let me, let me cough here. Got all the mute button. Let me get a sip of water. Mmm. Agua. Um, the demons are a disembodied spirit of the Nephilim that roam the earth. We are told in the book of Enoch, I, I know canon, but we are told in the book of Enoch, in the latter days, the spirits of the Nephilim will rise up against the men and women of earth and seek to destroy them. There you go. Could it be that the greys are, in fact, biologically created bio-body suits where the, the demons can actually interface inhabit these shells and move about. And that's what I think they are. Um, my friend and colleague, David Flynn, who is no longer with us, and I once had a, a, a phone conversation about that very thing when I asked David um, and presented a theory to him, and he agreed that, yes, he thought the greys were some sort of a biologically, for lack of a better word, for these deep demands um, to, let me see, hold on, Rick, to uh, to manifest. How do I get the chat? You're telling me. Uh, give me a second here, guys. I always forget. I, what I say, maybe I'll just say it for you. Basically, um, folks, if you call the station when the show isn't on, I, I cannot get you in touch with LA. So you're gonna you're gonna have to send him an email, or try to reach him through other means. But I, I get called every day, and I don't have him saying hello to you. But uh, I I can't get you in touch with LA. So I just thought that was important people to know. Thank you. And look, folks, if you want to get a hold of me, shoot me an email, la at lamarzulli.net, la at lamarzulli.net. Again, the shorter the sentence is, the better it is. And if it's, um, you know, you got to talk to me, shoot me an email, and conversations on the phone do take place here on a weekly basis. So um, it's part of what we do. But it's just me and my wife. I mean, it's just the two of us. There is no stuff. Um, when you call my phone number, and I'm not going to give it over the air, uh, you get me or the wife. That's what you get. So it's like uh, there's no answer service or secretary screen call. So it's a very small and pop little deal here, and it's important that uh, you guys know that. Rick, I'm 